you know, there's an old joke about how to wind up with a uh, small fortune after owning a bookstore for several years. And uh, it's a step-by-step -step process, right? S step one, start with a large fortune. <laughs> and that's true. Mo most of you who've been watching my channel know that, uh, that I owned a bookstore about 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, I opened up right about the time they uh, launched the Amazon Kindle product which, uh, you know, some might construe as being poor timing in the extreme. I don't know. I was probably skeptical about the whole thing. But, you know, obviously my bookstore went out of business. I never made a profit. In fact, I never even broke even. So I might be exactly the wrong person to watch a video from about how to open your own bookstore. But at the same time, I, I like to think that I learned a lot of lessons about what I should have done and what I would do differently if I owned a bookstore today. And it's very possible that I might open a new bookstore at some point in the future. And, and I will do things differently. And this video is kind of a preview of, of what I would do differently, okay? So I've organized this into a rough list of, of what I would do differently. The first thing I would do differently is, of course, <clears throat> when I was growing up, you know, every small town had a little new and used bookstore, or at least it seemed that way to me. My small town had a had a bookstore on the square called Cardwell's Books and Hobbies, and it was owned by a gentleman named Paul Cardwell. You know, uh, I'll be honest with you. I don't know how he could afford to stay open. You know, I would hang out up there for six, seven, eight hours at a time. We played role-playing games up there, you know, me and some of my pals. And not, well, not Dungeons and Dragons, but one of its competitors, RuneQuest, which I'm not going to get into the difference in that. But uh, but needless to say, you know, you could sit up there for six, seven, eight hours a day, and he might have one or two customers come in. I think he said that he made most of his money from engraving Bibles for people. But I rarely saw him sell a lot of books or games to anybody except for me and my buddies that hung out there. And, you know, there were only five or six of us, maybe 10 in a good year or something like that. But now, you know, small towns, you don't see bookstores in small towns anymore. Not that I've noticed anyway. When I opened Erie Books in Wiley, Texas, one of the ways I got my starting inventory was by buying out all the horror books at the new used bookstore in Bottom, Texas, which was going out of business. And, and that was my starting inventory was just their, their, you know, horror book section. Uh, yeah, I owned an all horror bookstore in a small town called Wiley, Texas, which, uh, which, you know, anyway, I had experience as a customer in bookstores. I didn't have experience as an employee or manager in a bookstore. And looking back, if I could do things differently, I would have gotten a job at a couple of bookstores and worked there for a little while just to see if I would have liked it, just to, to get a feel for what kind of procedures they use in these various bookstores and, and what kind of business procedures they had in place to, to make their bookstores succeed. But, uh, but I didn't do that. You know, I, uh, I had a lot of money, so I certainly didn't need a job. And uh, my bookstore would not have stayed open as long as it did if I didn't have a lot of money. But I really was that guy who started with a large fortune and wound up with a small fortune after uh, after owning a bookstore. Because, uh, you know, the, the bookstore was named Erie Books. But my friend Cliff likes to tell me that I should have named the bookstore Randy's Folly. So, yeah, that's the first thing I would recommend to someone who wants to own their own bookstore. Is to start off by working in a bookstore and see if you like it. And one of the things about... Book, the bookstore business, it's kind of like being a librarian. I have friends who are librarians who talk about how everybody's like, oh, I'd love to be a librarian. I just love to read. And, you know, librarians don't get to sit around and read all day. You know, they're busy helping uh, the, the customers who come into the library. They're shelving books. They're organizing things. They're doing inventory. You know, it's not a, you know, I just sit there and read kind of job. I had a job like that once though. I worked at a gas station in Bonham, Texas, small town Bonham, Texas, did almost no sales. And, you know, I worked Saturday and Sunday during the day. I think I worked from, no, I worked at night. It's been a long time ago and my memory's starting to fail. But uh, I'm pretty sure I worked from like uh, 2 p.m. till 10 p.m. And, 
you know, some days I might be lucky to have six customers come in. So uh, all those huge Stephen King books that I read, I read most of them while I was working at Town and Country in Bonham, Texas. So anyway, that's my first tip if you want to open your own bookstore is to work in a bookstore first just to get a feel for whether or not you'd like it, okay? Then uh, my second tip for, for opening your own bookstore is to manage your expectations. I think it would be difficult, if not impossible, for most people to own a bookstore and get rich from that business or even to make much more than a, than a living wage. I think owning a bookstore is one of those lifestyle businesses where you own the, the bookstore because you want to live the lifestyle of someone who owns a bookstore. Um, you know, this bookish life, so to speak. I exchanged a few emails and text messages with my old Shakespeare professor when I owned my bookstore, and, and he's passed away since then. But uh, the topic of most of our conversations was how wonderful it was that we had both found a way to live a life, to live a bookish life, to live a life where we were surrounded by books and got to interact with books all the time. And, uh, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, it's a good life and it is a good life. So if that's your expectation, then, then that can be a lot of fun. But if you think you're going to go into the bookstore business and make a lot of money, maybe, maybe you can, you know, I don't know. I don't think it's a real solid business model. You know, my friend Steve Donahue likes to point out all the time, there's just not a whole lot of us who read anymore. So your customer base from the very beginning is really small. And a lot of the people who do read, they're not buying their books at the bookstore. They're buying them from Amazon. Because let's face it, if you go to Amazon, most books are for sale at a 30% discount. You know, and new books have a markup of 40%. So, you know, you just really can't compete on price. You know, at the time I owned Erie Books, mass market paperbacks sold for about seven ninety nine. Okay, um, my discount through the wholesaler was forty percent. So, so eight dollars less forty percent. That's four dollars and eighty cents. So I've got three dollars and twenty cents worth of profit to play with there. But if I try to match Amazon's price, you know, I've only got about eighty cents profit per book. Um, that's not a lot of money, man. It's really not. Uh, you have to sell a lot of books at 80 cents a book. And my experience was you're just not going to sell that many books. So, so, you know, keep your expectations in check about your bookstore before you open it. Uh, think long and hard about what your goals are. If you want to make a lot of money and if you want to get rich, I'm going to suggest that another line of work or another business is probably going to be a better choice. Okay, so... Which brings me to another point. I used to work at Hotels.com, and uh, and I got to be pretty friendly with the CEO there, David Littman. And he explained to me early on, and, and I'm talking this was years ago. I went to work there in 1996. But I think it was my first year I went to work there, and we were talking about business. And he was explaining to me that most businesses fail because they're woefully undercapitalized. And they tell you that you need to have enough cash before you open a business to live on for a year without making a profit. But he suggested to me that it would be even better for you to have enough cash to go two years without making a profit. But your goal should be to make a profit immediately. And that's where most businesses fail. They think something magical is gonna happen over that year where they're gonna go from unprofitable to profitable. But, you know, the, the point is, if you don't already have a lot of money, you've got no business opening a bookstore. Now, maybe you could sell books on eBay. Maybe you could have a booth at the local flea market. And there's nothing wrong with either of those business models. I've done both of those, too. You know, uh, when, when Erie Books closed, I sold almost the entire inventory to a bookstore out in California. And I don't remember the name of the bookstore in California, but my guess is they still have the best horror section in all the country because, you know, I carried over 5,000 titles. It was, it was really nice, but I did not sell all my books. I, I had some left over and I, and I had some other products left over, games and that sort of thing, which, uh, you know, I went on to sell at a flea market. So, you know, I'm not above that sort of thing. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think you have to look down on it or anything, but if you're going to actually rent a retail location and maybe even have an employee or two, you need to have a stack of money in the bank. Okay. You need to make sure that you're, 
Your bills are all cut up. You should be out of debt. You should have insurance. You should have money and savings set aside for retirement. All those things, okay, before you open your bookstore. Otherwise, you know, you know, opening a bookstore, opening any business is a gamble. Opening a bookstore is probably even more of a gamble now more than ever before. So, so capitalization is a big thing. Think about that. You know, if, if you don't have money in the bank, save some money and put it in the bank. Lower those expenses really low because even if you think you've got a terrific business model for your bookstore, uh, I think you'll be surprised at how little money a bookstore makes, okay? Which brings me to another point, and this is a big point, and you probably thought about this already. I opened a niche bookstore. You know, we carried all, all horror books. And the reason that I did this was because, here was my line of thinking, okay? Who's the most popular author in America? Stephen King. What does he write? Horror books. Well, okay, people must love horror books. Horror movies always make a lot of money at the movie theater. So why not open a bookstore that caters to that audience? And I knew there was one store that, that, that had already done that out in California. It's called Dark Dell because he's it's still there. It's in Bird Bank. If you go by there to visit, tell Dell House, and I said hi. He's the owner there. He's, he was always he was there when I went by to visit. He probably doesn't remember me, but tell him I said hi anyway. But okay, so Bird Bank, California is one thing. All right, there's plenty of people in California, major metropolitan area. Wiley, Texas is a whole different story, okay? Wiley could loosely be considered a suburb of Dallas, but it's pretty far out there. When I had a job in Dallas and I was commuting from that job, from Wiley into Dallas, my commute was an hour a day if there was traffic. On the weekend or if I was going in or coming home in an off hour or something like that, you know, it wasn't so bad, it was maybe 40 minutes, but with traffic, it was an hour each way. So it was pretty far out there. And it's, you know, it's a small town. I don't know that a general bookstore that covered everything would have been very successful in Wiley, Texas, much less a niche bookstore. So I did have what I thought was probably the best location in town. And in, in, in Wiley, Texas, they don't really have a town square. They have a two block strip called Ballard Street. And I was on Ballard Street. And uh, it was a fun location. And I liked all my neighbors. There was a donut shop right next door. There was a guy who had, uh, the guy next door to that had a really cool business. Uh, it was a slot car racing business. But I mean, those people who were racing slot cars, they never came over to buy books. And I don't think anybody who was reading books in my bookstore spent a whole lot of time going over there and racing those slot cars either. Um, but it was a really fun experience. It was a great location there in town. But problem is the town itself was not a great location. If I were to choose a location for my next bookstore, I would go for something in a town that had at least 100,000 people and hopefully with a couple of universities. I live in Denton, Texas right now. We have uh, two universities here, University of North Texas and, and Texas Women's University, TWU. And we have multiple bookstores that seem to be thriving. There's uh, Books and More, Books, Records and More, there's Ruth's Room 2, which is also a thrift shop. You'll notice, too, that these bookstores, and I'm going to get to this point in a minute, but you'll notice, too, that these bookstores carry more than just books. Books, records, and more. I guarantee you they're making more money from their record sales than they are from their book sales. Ruth's Room 2. That's a uh, thrift store. I guarantee you they're making more money selling furniture and knickknacks there than they are from selling books. There's uh, Recycled Books which is on the square. And Recycled Books is one of the most glorious bookstores in the world. They have over a million books there. It's in the old Denton Opera House. It's this huge pink and purple building. And I remember in 1988 when I moved here, Recycled Books was in a tiny strip mall right next to TWU. And I don't know how many square foot it was, but I, it couldn't have been more than a thousand square feet. But they did so well managing their business that they eventually had to move down to the square. And in Denton, Texas, the square is the place to be. It wasn't always, but it's the place to be. There's a lot of foot traffic there. If you go to Recycle Books, the place is packed. And they carry everything, except romance novels. They don't carry romance novels at Recycle Books. If you want romance novels in Denton, Texas, you got to go to Books, Records, and more, because those are the guys who carry the romance novels. Anyway, think long and hard about the location for your bookstore. 
okay, because it makes a huge difference. Unless you're planning to do a lot of mail order stuff out of your bookstore, in which case you're just renting an office. But uh, but, but that's not really what this video is about. I don't really, you know, I don't think it would be that interesting to run up an eBay business selling books full time. Uh, so that's not what this video is about. So, okay, and, and, you know what? And it's almost a cliche to even bring up location. It was just such a big mistake that I made that I feel the need to point it out. Location, location, location. Okay, so here's the other big mistake that I made, okay? So now we're gonna talk about whether you carry used books, new books, antique books, how much money you're gonna make from each book. And to me, this was the biggest thing about my bookstore that lost me so much money. I decided I was gonna run a bookstore that carried both new books and used books. And if I had it to do over again, I would only carry used books. I would not carry new books at all. And I'll tell you why, okay? So when you're a bookstore, most people who run a bookstore and carry new books are buying their books from a wholesaler called Ingram. And the standard deal with Ingram is you get a 40% discount on most books. Not all books. Some books have a different uh, discount, usually lower. Okay, so, you know, like we talked about before, if you've got an $8 book, you're going to pay $4.80 for it and make $3.20 tops. And if you're offering a 10% student discount or if you're trying to match prices with other places, you know, that margin gets eaten up really fast, okay? But, okay, let's talk about, uh, let's say you got a $30 book, okay? So at a 40% discount, that means you, you've got $18 into the book and you've got $12 profit. We're just going to use that $30 book because the math is easy on it, okay? So let's say you own a used bookstore, though, okay? So the standard for a used bookstore, and it's even the standard for people who are dealing with antique books, is to buy a book for about one-third of what you expect to sell it for. And most used bookstores, at least in the past, um, have a standard pricing policy where they sell books at half the cover price, okay? So let's say you've got that same $30 book that you would buy new from, from Ingram for, for $18 and sell it in hopes of making a $12 profit. So now you got this $30 book, your customer brings it in, you're gonna sell it for $15. You're gonna buy it from uh, the person who's selling it to you for $5, okay? So you've got uh, $5 into it and you're making $10 profit. Okay, on a $15 book. So, I don't know if you remember or not, but buying it new, you only made $12 profit. And you had $18 into it. Now you got $5 into it and you're making $10 profit. You see what a big difference that is there? And on top of that, you can offer credit instead of money for the books that you buy. Which means that you're not, you're, you're, you're increasing the amount of stock that you have in your store without an outlay of funds. And, and that makes a huge difference in terms of your economics model. It's unbelievable the difference that it makes. So, you know, if I had to do it over again, first of all, I wouldn't launch a niche bookstore. I would launch a general bookstore, okay? Second of all, I would only deal in used books. Only thing I'd be interested in dealing in because the markups are so high. And then, of course, recycled books didn't do this uh, at first, but Recycled Books also carries a lot of collectible books, first editions, signed books, that sort of thing. Some people run bookstores, that's all they carry. Now that is not the kind of bookstore that I would want to run, although that's probably, in terms of making money, the best of all possible bookstore businesses. So, you know, keep that in mind. You can, you can do any combination of those too. You can run a bookstore that only sells new books, you can run a bookstore that sells new and used books. You can run a bookstore that only sells used books. But you can add in special editions to any of those. But the thing is, you know, there's a certain amount of knowledge that's required when you're dealing with collectible books that a lot of people just don't have. My friend Forrest Jackson in Dallas taught me a lot about the, the collectible book business. He owned uh, Rosedale Rare Books, which was close to SMU. And, uh, and we had a lot of funds. We had a lot of fun. And uh, in fact, Forrest, I was one of Forrest's big customers too, because at one time I collected a lot of Arkham House first editions, which was a lot of fun. So, all right, used bookstore, great location, not a niche kind of thing. You've got your expectations in check. The next thing you need to do is when you pick out that location and you rent that retail space, 
you need to rent a really small retail space. And I'll tell you why, okay? Everybody dreams of owning this huge bookstore with all these customers milling around in there and stuff. But that's not how it's going to be to start out. Almost certainly not going to be that way. And retail space is rented by the square foot. So the bigger the retail space you rent is, the, the more you pay. So, you know, my, also, you get a big retail space, what do you got to have? Lots of stock. You got to fill that place. You don't need a big empty retail space. So if you've got a small location, something with 500, 600, 700 square feet, you don't need nearly as much inventory and stock as you would if you got a place that was 1,500 or 2,000 square feet. I think the, the location I had was about 2,000 square feet, way too big, and I spent way too much money putting books on shelves that no one was ever going to buy. So, uh, so start with a really, really small retail location, and then you can decide to, to, to get into a bigger retail location if you need to later. Okay. Now, here's the big tip. Okay, this is the big tip. And this comes straight from Dell House and who owns Dark Delicacies in California. And this was another big mistake that I made. Okay, so I ran a bookstore and 80% of my inventory, 80% of what I had for sale, were books. Makes sense, right? It's a bookstore. <clears throat> Dell House had told me that was a mistake. He said that 50% of what I have put out for sale or more should be gift items because the markup is so much better on those items. And believe it or not, they sell way better than books. So, you know, at, at Dark Delicacies, it was a horror theme bookstore, but they had, you know, little trinket jewelry, that kind of thing, like little earrings with skulls on them. They had little, <clears throat> excuse me, pairs of socks with, with skeletons and, and zombies and ghouls dancing around on them. Um, I don't remember what all they had, but... <clears throat> There's a lot of different, excuse me, I'm, I'm frog in my throat this morning. But I just had a lot of different things that you could buy there. And I should have figured this out myself at my bookstore because I had horror movie t-shirts that I sold. And the markup on those was great. You know, I'd buy those shirts for 6 to $7, sell them for $20 a piece. And, uh, and I sold more t-shirts probably than any other product there. What I didn't sell a lot of, I kept horror, I had a horror movie section. And I never sold a movie. Never. Nobody was interested in buying DVDs or Blu-rays or horror movies. Just not at all. <clears throat> Which kind of surprised me. Because I had a TV set up with horror movies playing on it all the time and stuff. But, so think real hard about what kind of product mix you're going to have in your store. And find as many products as you can with a really, really high markup. There's a reason movie theaters make so much money. And it's because of the, the low price of popcorn and soda pop. You know, you take a product that costs a nickel to create and then you sell it for two, three dollars. You know, that's a recipe for success. And that's going to make up for the fact that even with used books, your markup is, is relatively low and your sales are going to be relatively low. So, you know, and it's easy to figure out products that you can sell in bookstores, man. Coffee mugs with the name of your bookstore serve as advertising for your bookstore and they sell uh, bookmarks, t-shirts, carrying bags. These are all products that are available at Recycle Books down at the square and uh, ball caps. And they don't necessarily have to be, you know, products that promote your business, but they can be. So they can serve a dual purpose that way. So, you know, and the other thing, and this is something, okay, so I'm going to wrap up with this point. I think this is point number seven or eight or whatever, but who's counting, right? I'm going to put 10 in the title of this video because people like top 10 lists, but I don't think I've made 10 whole points. <clears throat> Just don't tell anybody. So anyway, the other thing, this is something I did right at my bookstore. You need, owning a bookstore in some ways is like owning a bar. You need to give people a reason to come in. You need to hold regular events. The obvious event to hold at a bookstore is a book club. And we had a monthly book club at Erie Books, and it was one of the most gratifying parts of the experience was because I'm still good friends with, with several of the people who came to my book club at, at my bookstore. And uh, so, you know, having a book club, <clears throat> there's different ways of, of running that sort of thing. If, if you're running a bookstore with all kinds of books in it instead of a niche bookstore like I did, you could have, you know, 
multiple book clubs. You know, you could have a mystery book club, a horror book club, a romance book club, just whatever the people who come into your bookstore are interested in. But that's not the only kind of event you can have at your bookstore. You can also have open mic night and let musicians come in. You can have poetry readings. You can have authors come in and do readings and signings. The, the possibilities for events to draw people into your bookstore are practically endless. One of my favorite events was on January 8th every year. January 8th is Elvis Presley's birthday. <clears throat> but on January 8th every year, we would have a party at my bookstore uh, to celebrate Elvis Presley's birthday. And I was friends with, with an Elvis impersonator named Johnny Harrow, who was, the, in my opinion, the greatest Elvis tribute artist of all time. A really, really sweet guy. But, you know, we had him come in and perform, and then we had copies of Bubba Hotep, which is a novel, novella, really, by Joe Lansdale about Elvis Presley in a nursing home. And the premise of the novel is that Elvis decided he was tired of being famous, and he switched identities with an Elvis tribute artist, and the Elvis tribute artist died of a heart attack, and everybody thought he was Elvis, and Elvis couldn't take his own identity back, but it was okay. So now he's elderly and living in a nursing home and there's some kind of Egyptian mummy. Anyway, it was a big fun and I had loads of signed copies of the book because Joe Lansdale's right here in East Texas. He lives not too terribly far from here. We did it all by mail. I'm not friends with Joe Lansdale, although he was really nice when I corresponded with him. But anyway, so, you know, just getting creative and having fun events and giving people a reason to come in, that's going to do nothing but increase sales at your bookstore. So, that is my video with my thoughts on how to own your own bookstore without going broke. And none of that stuff is going to guarantee that you're going to succeed with a big bookstore business. Mostly, it's just my thoughts on a lot of the mistakes I made when I owned a bookstore. I thought somebody might be interested in that sort of thing. Thank you for watching. I'll have another video up soon. Have a great weekend.